And we are live for another episode of the Freedom Series live series with Keith Miller, who's uh, the boardroom coach and uh, head coach here at the Game Changers. And today I want to speak about all things scale and growth and the fact that many business owners wish to grow, uh, yet very few actually do. Keith, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Okay, Barry. Look, I'm very, very well. Thank you. So grateful to have you here. And uh, I think it's going to be a ripper, ripper conversation. And uh, if you're joining us live or on the, or on the replay, uh, please just let us know, like chuck a like or a love button. Uh, also post your comments. My team is uh, monitoring the chats across all the platforms we're live on right now, feeding your questions through to me and Keith. So if you've got any questions whatsoever for Keith, for myself throughout this interview, please comment below and we'll be sure to answer them before we wrap things up. Keith, uh, you're a big advocate of the scaling up methodology, Vern Harnish's scaling up methodology, which is based around four kind of core decisions, strategy, execution, cash, and people. What about that particular methodology do you feel is so robust in actually seeing businesses grow? Um, I've had, I started a number of businesses, uh, Barry, and uh, I got to a certain stage and I couldn't grow any further. Yeah. And it really frustrated the hell out of me because in both of those, uh, those two, three businesses, three businesses, I had a vision of being big, grand, uh, national. Uh, one was a public relations company, a national public relations I had a vision for. Yeah. Uh, but they got to a stage where there was a ceiling and I, and it just, I, 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 the, the harder I worked, the, the, worse, the worse I went. And so then the recession would come through and you, uh, you wouldn't have to worry too much about that. So yeah. um, the, um, the thing with, um, I came across scaling up and suddenly the heavens opened, the light came down, and it was the reason why I couldn't uh, grow both my businesses. It was so simple, and Vern had made something very com complex, very simple for us all mere mortals to follow. Yeah. What, what do you think it is um, that confuses most people when it comes to growing a business? Like, it's a great, it's a great thing you talk about, and I see, I, I just meet so many entrepreneurs that are experiencing a huge amount of overwhelm, no idea of what to do when, and they're willing to put the work in, they're willing to do the work. They're just not quite sure maybe where to focus their time. Like, what do you think it is that, that creates so much uncertainty in growing a business? Barry, um, it goes back to your opening statement. There's a, there's, there's a lot of business people who, who, would, who wish to grow their business. Yeah, and yeah. wishing to grow the business is not the answer. It's a huge desire to grow the business. Everyone will, everyone will say, look, I'll take growth. Yeah, I'd love to grow the company. But they don't sincerely believe or have the great desire to grow it. Yeah. And it's a bit like your name of your book. And by the way, I love the name, the title of your book, Path to Freedom. Yeah. Freedom is one of my favorite words. It really is. And I think that we take free for granted. And yeah. freedom is not something that we should have for granted. And it may be that because of the word F R double E in that word free, that we have got a right to freedom. We've got to fight for freedom. We've got to fight to, to, to grow our businesses. And if we can't reach down inside us and have a passion of growing our business, we're not going to get through that very low barrier to growth. And it really is a low barrier that mm -hmm. if everyone was focused and really desired to get that result, there is no doubt that they could get there. But as we know, there's only about 4% that actually grows. You've got to say, what's going on here? There's, there yeah. is something, there's a bigger game being played here. What is it? Well, it's very clear. It's very clear. If people read some books and they actually um, broke it down to very very simple things, as Vern's done, even just follow the, the book, follow the bouncing ball, and you'll get through. Yeah. Make make the Take the hard decisions and fight for it. Yeah. It's an interesting point that you say, like, we've got to fight for freedom. I, I personally believe the biggest fight is with ourself. Yes. Uh, not so yep. much with the economy, not so much with yes. uh, the strategy or the, the staff or anything outside of us. I think the biggest fight is at, with ourselves. Yep. I think that, I, I, totally uh, often, agree. I totally agree. Yeah, I, I think that we don't often take enough time to sit, uh, sit in the question, sit in the feeling of where we're at. I think intuitively all business owners know what they should be doing. But I think they don't spend enough time tuning in with themselves. They're too busy focusing on things outside of them, yes. second guessing themselves 
And that I think is the biggest block of the growth. Certainly it's been in my experience and with many, many people I've worked with before. And I'm curious to know, like if you're watching this live today or on a replay, like have you experienced in your business growth hitting that glass ceiling, like that, that seemingly invisible ceiling, like maybe you're there right now. Uh, if you have hit it once before and you've moved through, like what was the change? I'm curious to know, like what was the change for you that saw you move through that? Because as we know, Keith, like we talk about the valley of death, you know, business growth is not linear. It's not like start here and finish here. There's lots of these valleys we go back to and often like a, a slight recession in the business or a slight uh, feeling of going backwards is often a good thing because it allows us to build a stronger foundation to resolve things that are preventing us from scaling or growing bigger. So then we can take that next leap of growth moving forward. And, and again, I've seen this so many times in business owners where things start to go backwards and they freak out and they freak out because they're uncertain of the journey forwards. They haven't got the things in place that they need to be, to, to be measuring the right steps in business. And all they see is, is maybe revenue dropping off or profit dropping off, but they're not aware of the importance of, of aspects of that happening along their journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that because I was going to make, mention that, but I thought it might become a little bit esoteric, but it, it really does start with, with you and I. It's in your own mind and the growth of your business, the size of your business will equal your own size of your self-esteem. So mm -hmm. we cannot grow any business larger than how we feel about ourselves. So in a sense, we've got to work on ourselves before we work on our business mm -hmm. um, and grow our self-image. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, mate, you've, you've been around for a little while. You've seen a bunch of things. You've uh, said just, you've had, um, you've had, you've had. Well, that's, just... a, that's a very subtle way, Barry. Okay. All right. I'm more than 45. Yes, I know. <laughs> more um, than 55. Young at heart. Young at heart, mate. Um, uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. You've, you've had several businesses. You've worked with like a bunch of clients. Like you've had some coaching clients, I know, for more than 15, 16, 17 years. That's pretty impressive for a coach to retain a client for that amount of time. And anyone watching this who might have their own coaching agency knows that like the average retention that a lot of people see in the industry is like three to six months. And, you know, you've had clients, I think one client you mentioned, you know, 17, 18 years. What do you the think? Clothes and the tractors, yep. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is like the key to a long lasting relationship. Obviously there's growth because they wouldn't still have you there if they weren't seeing a tangible ROI on, on working with you and, and having you on board. But what do you think the kind of key differentiator is to, to building a lifelong relationship like that? Cause it is, it's a huge part of life. Like 18 years old, like that's a massive amount of time to be working with, with a client. Well, it's like asking Paul McCartney how he, how he wrote music and he can't even read or, or write music but he plays music he, he, uh, by ear. Uh, and so you're saying why? I'm not too sure. Uh, but if I break it down, uh, a couple of things. One, a, a coach has got to believe in the, 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 the coaching client, the client. He, he's got to believe in that person. And this yeah. comes from Bill Campbell, who coached uh, the likes of Steve Jobs and, and Steve Schmidt and, and Microsoft and Google, uh, who had a tremendous belief in the people that he coached more so than they had them in themselves. Yeah. The other thing is that um, you've just got to, you've just, you've got to be dedicated to that person. You know, yeah. I, you know, my definiteness, definiteness of purpose is to make this person outstandingly successful mm. so that uh, I will have an impact on him uh, more so than if he ever met, he never had met me. So my real goal is to make that person successful. Now that can be terribly frustrating because you can see a lot of things in this person, and if they just got off their butt bottom and they did some, they they can procrastinate, and they just took some steps forward, you know that they would broke through. Yeah. But you've got to pick them up. You've got to dust them down. You've got to kick them up the bum occasionally. But in a sense you've got to believe in them more than just money. There's money doesn't come into money follows, but you've got to believe in them and getting their goals, helping them get their goals. Yeah. Inter interesting point you raised. And it's something that we shared and spoke about uh, on yesterday's live stream session with Michael McNish is around that. And, and what I shared is that I honestly believe that, uh, you know, half of what moved my clients forward when I was coaching myself one-on-one -on -one was my belief in them is that I believed in them and, and what they're possible and what they're capable of far beyond what they believed in themselves.
Yeah. And, I, and I believe that that belief alone was enough of an instigator to see things start to move for them, forwards for them before we even talked about strategy, before we even talked about tactics, before we even started to dig into resolving some of the stuff internally within the inner game and their mindset that was preventing them from, from growing. Um, you know, you've been focusing and, and working and mentoring and coaching people around these four key decisions based on uh, the Gazelle's methodology. You're one of very few coaches worldwide with the Gazelle certification, uh, one of even fewer coaches worldwide with the uh, uh, metronome effect certification as well. You've been doing your research, Gary. What's that? You've been doing your research. That's good. I love absolutely, it. absolutely. Yeah. I know my people. Um, what do you think it is around these four key decisions in business that make such a huge impact and cause an exponential percentage of businesses to succeed versus those that don't? Because we know, as you said before, like 4% of businesses succeed or 4% of businesses make it to the million dollar mark. Uh, yeah. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they're profitable right? Or that the, that the business is running about the business owner. It just means they're still in business. They've got turnover. Uh, what do you think it is about these four key decisions, strategy, execution, people, and cash that kind of, I guess, holds the key to seeing businesses grow and scale? Okay. The, the four pillars, the four decisions are for, let's imagine, four balls uh, being juggled. Uh, once a upon a time, maybe 10 years ago, you could pick one or two and work well on those and, and succeed. Now, all three have got to be um, being juggled at the same time. And, and that really is keeping them in the air all the time and, and catching them. And the person having the discipline and the focus to do that. Mm. So they must have the discipline and focus because we have a natural bias to go to one, let's say the execution. I've got a great yeah. product, I can go to market. But we sort of know about strategy, but we don't because whatever people think about strategy, it's quite, it's not correct, yeah. uh, but they get carried away. And no one <laughs> wants to know about cash. You know, cash is, or, you know, oh, you know I'll look at my cash. My, my, my account will take care of that. My account will take care of that. Yeah. And it's crazy. It's crazy. You've got to say, why in the hell did you, did you get in the business? Well, you know, to, to succeed and be, you know, to, to, to have a successful business. But somewhere along the line, you had to, had to have an economic engine, which is generated by cash. But people just turn off from that. So it, it really is uh, keeping those four balls going at the same time and having the discipline to do that. Now, discipline and focus, I picked those two words from Scott Farquhar, who's, who was a client of Atlassian, I, I think out of, uh, of scaling up of Verns. Um, and, and, and he said, when asked, what were, the, what were the things that made him successful? He said those two things, focus and discipline. And, yeah. and you can't, you can't uh, mistake anything, something like that, that someone is as successful as he's been. But it, it is actually keeping the... Oh, I think we've just lost you there, Keith. I'm not sure whether it's my connection or whether it's uh, Keith's connection here, but we seem to have lost him. Alrighty, Keith is gone. We will wait for Keith to come back. Uh, interesting point that Keith raised about the natural biases that we have. Uh, as business owners, as human beings, we naturally gravitate, gravitate towards things that are maybe slightly easier for us or things that are more common or maybe things that we know. And so those four core decisions, as Keith mentioned, uh, you know, the methodology we use for when we help our clients get from uh, typically, you know, we can take clients on as early as a quarter million dollars in revenue, and we'll grow them to about two, two point five, three million dollars before we move into the boardroom program with Keith, where the four decisions really come into play. But those four balls are the four kind of core decisions. Are you back? Yes, my back. Sorry, we. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. That's okay. That's right. We lost you there, a bit. Uh, basically, what I was just saying is that you know that interesting point you mentioned around uh, the natural biases. You know, as business as business owners, we have natural biases towards gravitating towards things that are easy or comfortable things we've done in the past which is why uh, often, you know, many of us can procrastinate too. 
Whereas understanding we have those four kind of core areas of the business and understanding more so uh, what falls under each of them allows things to become a bit more comfortable with knowing where to focus our time, knowing where to focus uh, our energy and uh, where we can make the greatest impact as well. Uh, we had a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, there's one here from Justin from Sydney. Uh, just several questions. With, uh, with your years of experience, Keith, how do you differentiate yourself from other coaches with so many out there? Uh, First question. Well, this, this will, uh, I'm, I'm one of uh, 12 who are certified scaling up coaches who have been trained on the scaling up scaling methodology, um, which is an ongoing thing, by the way. And I, I would do, uh, and I know that my colleagues, uh, the, the uh, dozen or so coaches in Australia, would do about the same. We would do an extra 20 hours a week in the study of of um, of business, reading books, watching podcasts, everything, because I see I, I've got to be at the edge. I've got to be at the front edge as uh, to stay competitive. And I can't couldn't go through a whole week without not reading my Twitter feed, uh, Inc., Fortune magazine, uh, going on YouTube, um, and, and 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 reading books. Uh, I would just become dated as many of the coaches are. I mean, they they particularly, they find themselves out of work. So what I'll do, I'll be a coach. I don't know what the, gives them the qualification. But as you've said before, Barry, I've heard you say it, there's no real standard uh, for coaches. There's no um, uh, competency. Yeah. Uh, anybody can put the shingle out. And I guess the results will speak for themselves. They'll either go broke uh, or they'll get a couple of clients and they will just hang around the uh, the substance the subsistence, subsistence basis of uh, of just staying in business and not really exceeding the trouble is a lot of them um, murky the water and make it uh, make it not so good for all of us yeah yeah and it's interesting you put too though like like the the scaling up methodologies been proven time and time again some of the most successful companies in the year uh, in the world sorry uh have used them and their methodology you guys and your methodology to grow like atlassians a great example red balloon i know in australia is another great example um so there's there, there is a certification required behind that particular to say hey i'm a, I'm a qualified gazelles coach um and you've taken that further as well to take on board several other qualifications that marry in nicely with Vern's methodology yeah. Uh, the other question that Justin from City's got here too, and if you are watching live, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, hit the like button. Let us know that you're watching uh, and also put your questions below and uh, my team can bring them through to us so we can get them answered for you guys as well. Uh, Justin said, would you consider yourself more of a mentor or a coach? Well, I, I, I'm both. and have been both. Uh, a, a mentor is somebody that occasionally, uh, without no, any formality or structure, um, helps people who come and ask you for advice and I do that quite frequently and regularly whereas a coach has is a skill um, really mastering the art of questions and probing and pushing people uh, versus a consultant who goes into a business and finds out what the problem is and then fixes the problem and then leaves with a hundred thousand dollar check and the person left behind has got no idea what that person did but may have yeah. solved the problem but a coach is a particularly, I, I, I relate very strongly to the coach because um, you can uh, push people, can motivate people, um, and, and, and you can help them see in themselves what their potential is for the future. So uh, the coach is a, is a distinctive, uh, distinctive role for particularly owners of businesses, leaders in that regard, to, to provide a sounding board. They don't do the job. They, they push through questions and get the, 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 the participant, the uh, person being coached, to, to dig in deep inside them and come up with the answer. A coach shouldn't be able, should not give the answer. That's probably the, 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 the sin in coaching and those people who aren't particularly well trained in coach will do that and therefore will give their own life experiences, be it good or bad. It's really about asking questions so that the, the person that is being coached actually finds that answer in themselves. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's an important point you raise. And I think that a good business mentor 
coach, growth, expert, facilitator uh, can dance between two. Yeah. Because if, <clears throat> if it's a purely a mentor relationship, a mentorship or mentor e relationship, uh, often the business owner doesn't bear the same weight with the information because yeah. it's been easily given to them. As opposed to when they're asked questions, they have to find it with themselves. They tend to own that experience more. And for any of you that, that have a business and, and work with staff, you know, if you're constantly bringing your staff up and, and teaching them that when they come to you, you give them the answers, tell me where you're at right now. Like I guarantee you're working way more hours than you need to. And you're probably feeling that if you step out of the business, things fall apart because you're the weakest link right now. And it's the same thing too in that mentorship relationship. The moment the mentor steps out, the business kind of steps down. Whereas, you know, a good coach or a good growth expert will uh, use a bit of mentorship where required. Hey, this is the way I've done it in the past. This is how it's worked for me. But then I'll also ask the hard questions to allow the business owner to create the breakthroughs. And it's kind of that methodology. It's like, if I give you a fish, I'll feed you for a night. If I teach you to fish, I'll feed you for a life. Like, I think a good coach should be able to teach someone how to fish. So when they step away, the business can continue to grow, go on and grow and scale without them needing to be involved as opposed to them being so deeply ingrained in the business as many business owners are. Yeah, very true. A, a coach has got to bury their ego. Their, their ego has got to be left behind because otherwise it's all about them and my experience. And I've done that. That That's probably the worst thing you can do. It, it's left behind. So you don't bring in, you use the example and you use your, your own life's experience, but it's really about helping them understand rather than you telling them the solution. That's yeah. that's uh, more empowering for the person involved. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, Keith, like in your uh, experience working with, with the clients you have and helping them grow on scale, what do you think the number one uh, biggest thing is that holds them back, holds them back from attaining that true freedom where their business can operate without them, they've got good consistent cash flow, uh, and th they can essentially step away. What do you think is the biggest thing that kind of holds them back or stops them? I know we spoke a bit about mindset, a bit, a bit about the glass. So let's go a bit, I guess, more granular. Taking action, Barry. I think taking action holds them back. I, I was I was talking to a, a, one of our clients uh, yesterday, and I and I said uh, I, I said uh, George, I said George, I just want to compliment you because when we talk um, in the discussion, you'll say. Keith, that, that, that was a great idea. Look, thank you very much for that. And it might be a, a, a might have come out through a conversation. It might have been come from a, from from a suggestion. And uh, he will take it down and he'll do something with it. Whereas many people will push back and explain to you why they haven't taken that action or why it won't work. And and I said to Joyce, so look, I I both I, I enjoy working with you, but importantly, you have got your own self-confidence and self-esteem very healthy that you can accept that you don't have all the answers mm -hmm. and that you're willing to take those suggestions and solutions for things that you need to be solved uh, without question because somewhere along the line he's got the he believes in in us and believe believes in me that the advice is good so without any pushback he takes it and he puts it straight into straight into action uh, yeah. within within a few days. And that's probably a marked thing because uh, um, uh, 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 a significant thing that a lot of people take it down and they agree and the action's decided, but it doesn't get taken. The, 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 the action is left in the room or left, left behind somewhere else because we just didn't get around to doing it. Well, I think it's just an action too. You know, like I... I... I see people, they'll take a whole bunch of action. They get inspired, they take a whole bunch of action, start a whole bunch of stuff everywhere. And then next week they, they back right off again, or it gets too overwhelming or they procrastinate. I think consistent action, you know, like over my last 18 years of, of, of building businesses and helping other people build businesses, I think really looking back now and reflecting, the one thing that's been key for me is consistent action. Even if, even if the outcome wasn't what I wanted, yep. consistently every day getting up and taking a step towards my goals, taking a step towards achieving my vision, whatever that is. You know, if we're not moving, it's very hard for a ship to turn that's not actually accelerating forwards. And yep. your business is the same. If your business is not moving forwards, if you're not moving forward and taking action, it's very hard to, to turn directions or to understand what the hell's going on. Um, <clears throat> Tom's got a question uh, here. And if you're watching us, welcome. Uh, Chuck your questions in below and I'll get uh, Rafa to send them through. 
Uh, Tom said, what's your particular style in, in establishing rapport with especially guarded and stubborn clients? Establishing your rapport. Uh, well, there, there is ways to um, create rapport. And, uh, and for those who have uh, studied NLP, it's in terms of matching, uh, matching um, your, 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 your um, uh, physiology for a start uh, and tone. Uh, so that help, can help people uh, come into rapport. But if it's a matter of getting, well, let me say this. Let, let me go back a little bit. When I uh, speak to someone about coaching them or coming in the boardroom, I'll ask them three questions. And the three questions are, uh, do you, uh, do you ha have a passion uh, to, to grow your business? Now, if they say, yeah, sort of, I know that that person's not, not, not an ideal uh, uh, client. Uh, the second question is, do you have a burning desire to grow the business? And once again, they've got to have a burning desire. Mm. And thirdly, I ask them, can you be coached? Are you coachable? Mm. Um, and those three questions will decide whether I will take on somebody who, um, and usually those stubborn people don't get to that stage. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very good point. Like um, there's some questions around this yesterday and, we just typically don't get clients like that. You know, like us as a company, we, we generate two to 300 inquiries week in, week out, and we let five of them through into becoming clients. Like we have a very good vetting and screening process that ensures we, we, we bring in people that we want to work with that are a good culture fit for, for us as a company, that are, that are going to bring something to the table in terms of, of their experience with other members, but they're going to be coachable and take on board things. Like I remember back when I was at, a startup coach, you know, like many, many years ago, nine years ago, um, I had stubborn clients and had clients that weren't listened. But, you know, I think it comes back to what you shared before, Keith, like I had a business that represented my level of self-worth or self-belief at that point in time. And the moment that I started putting my foot down, like I would have clients that would cancel half an hour before a session, I'd be in the car on the way there. Uh, and it was the moment that I started to, to charge a higher rate, started to be clearer on the boundaries and, and, the formalities that they had to to abide by to work with me, but I started better, getting better quality clients. And it wasn't that they weren't there before; they were always there. The good clients were always there. I was just choosing to take on board, you know, difficult clients, challenging clients, because I didn't believe that I could, you know, maybe consciously or unconsciously, didn't believe I could, I could, I was worthy of greater clients than that. Um, and so I think there's a, you know, what we find is every time we tell someone no, it's like we t we have another three people wanting to say yes. You know, I think uh, Richard Branson might have been the one that said, you know, growing a business is more around not what you say yes to, but the things you say no to. Yeah, true. And I, I think that um, it's easy for us to get caught into a scarce mindset where we're like a startup business and it's like, we need the work. I've got to pay my staff. But that's a very, very slippery slope that's very hard to get out of, as opposed to being clear of like, who are you? Who do you serve? You know, how does your product or service benefit others? And being clear of who's a fit for you and who's not. And we've had clients we've turned away that weren't a fit that have gone and referred people to us that were a fit. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of power in the known. There's a lot of power in being clear of what your worth is and what you want to accept and tolerate and what you're not. Yes. Uh, not nicely put, Keith. A um, couple of questions for me, and if you guys have got questions, now be the time to ask before we wrap this up shortly. Keith, can I say add, add <clears throat> just on that, on, on that tail, that Barry? I, I see self-esteem and self-image is like a, a, a carton of milk that you take out of the fridge and you might happen to leave it out on a summer's day. It goes off. And, and that's, what, that's, that's how precious our self-image is. If we leave it exposed to negative forces, then it will beat that self-image up and we won't have the confidence to push forward. So mm -hmm. what we do is with the milk is where we take it out, we usually put it back in the fridge because it's very fragile. And our self-image is very, very fragile too. It mm. can get knocked about at times, and particularly in this world where everyone wants to tell you what they should be doing or negative speaking, uh, it, it, it can actually take its toll and not even realise. And mm. so, therefore, you become you 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 go into your shell uh, and you don't feel worthy. So, uh, everyone, uh, and certainly I do, I've got to be working on my self-image to pump it up, pump the tires up, keep it growing um, so that 
I can reach uh, and, and stretch uh, farther and longer and, 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 and take on those big, those big uh, uh, projects because I know if I, if, I, if I don't, I will subconsciously uh, set myself up for failure or push them away because yeah. I know that that, whatever that is, doesn't equal where I'm, 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 I'm worthy to have that. So to do that, I've got to work on me so that I can get there, so I can attract those bigger things in my life. Yeah, it's nicely put. It's it's funny because it's something that I touch on um, in my book. So there's there's a, there's a chapter on goal setting, and of course everyone's heard the traditional like the smart goals and so forth, things like that. But this is this is a little bit more esoteric than that. And uh, not only is it esoteric, it works ridiculously well. And it comes back to goal setting around first starting with 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 honoring your integrity. You know, what I realized uh, many, many years ago is that when I was saying to people I'd do things and then not following through, maybe sometimes having no intention to follow through and other times having intention but not following through, what I realized is I was damaging that self-image. What I was doing is I was building a relationship with myself that I wasn't to be trusted. Now, what we tend to do as human beings is we're always willing to let ourselves down before we let others down. It's just part of who we are naturally as, as human beings. So if we're going out there letting other people down through not following through on our word or committing to things that, that we don't follow through on, that we don't keep our integrity with, when we go to set goals or we go to create a vision for ourselves, how do we ever expect to actually follow that through when we've got a past history of letting other people down? And yeah. it's something that I, I dive into quite deeply here, uh, both in the goal setting section, but also towards the mindset section at the end of the book, because it's something I don't see a lot of people talk about. But it's also why I see so many people do fail in business is, is because of their relationship with their inner game. Everyone's yep. talking strategy. Everyone's talking tactics. Everyone's talking about all these things you need to do, 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 do. But the reality is, is it's like if you look at a very basic NLP model, which is be, do, have. Yep. It's like be, do, have. You mm -hmm. start with what do you want to have? Like let's say I want to have a half million dollar a year wage. Let's say a, a take home drawings. Cool. Like we go back a step and we go, what do we have to do to, to, to get that? That's the doing part. That's the strategy, that tactic. But then the more important part is, well, who do we have to be to do the things we have to do to have what we want to have? Mm -hmm. And it always starts in the being. Mm -hmm. Yet so often people start with the having and mm -hmm. the comparison of not getting what they want or wondering why they're not there yet, mm -hmm. or that they get too stuck in the doing and they're constantly around busy doing a million things at once, going nowhere fast. But very few people start with the being. And it's like, okay, well, if I want to have this wage or you know, this investment portfolio or this culture in my organization or create this difference in the world, who do I first have to start being? First for myself before anyone else, then to those around me. And then through being that, what are the doing that I have to do? And so it's, it, I think you put it quite well, Keith, there's, there's certainly a matter of action, but equally too, if you don't first align with it internally, you never need there either. No, 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 no. Yeah. And by the way, because I know, I know you want to move on to some other questions. Uh, and once again, freedom, terrific word. And to me, freedom is really the law of cause and effect. You cannot have freedom unless you're on the right side of that equation. Yeah. So while you say, well, I, I want freedom, you may well be the recipient. In other words, the effect. And it's every other one, everyone else's fault because I don't have the money. I don't have the freedom of, from debt, etc. Yeah. If you don't get yourself back on the cause side, then you'll always be wanting to have mm whatever it is, and let's say in this case, freedom. So yeah. you've got to be the instigator rather than the recipient. You've got to be the, um, you can't be the uh, the victim. Uh, you, you must be the activator and controller of your life. And that's what personal leadership is. So it goes full circle. If you want to grow your business, you've got to take full responsibility for who you are and accountability and seek that freedom by being on the right side of that equation. There's, there's so much bubbling off right now, like so many lessons I've learned over the years. Like I remember a distinct conversation. I used to have stuff towards people that had money. This is a long time ago, right? But, but within the last 18 years of my business journey, um, I used to have stuff towards people that had money. And I remember talking to someone at one point, like a coach or a mentor of mine, and they said, how the hell do you ever expect to be wealthy when that's the way you perceive wealthy people? And they're, they're like, how are you going to attract something for you and, and, and create the experience for you when you just dislike that aspect in somebody else? There's complete cognitive dissonance there. 
They said, when you heal that relationship within you and you can look at someone who's wealthy, look at someone who's successful, look at someone who's, who's free, whatever that is, and respect and appreciate who they are and what they've had to have gone through to be there, yep. then you can have it for you. Yep. Yep. And that was just like a, yep. you know, one thing that I, I wrote about in here, like I remember distinctly, I was in a cafe uh, in Canggu, Indonesia, earlier this year, writing one of the chapters. And I was sitting there and I was having a conversation just prior with a friend of mine. And she said to me, don't you feel guilty, Barry, that you're here in Bali, uh, not working, surfing, playing guitar, writing your book, and you've got a team at home that's working full time to run your business. I was like, not at all. She's like, how do you not feel guilty about that? I said, I used to. Like, I wasn't always like this. I was like, but I've, I've, I've earned this. I've worked hard. I've put the things in place. And, and right now I'm serving the business and the vision the way that I'm here to serve. Yep. And my team are serving the vision the way that they're here to serve right now. And if you rang them up, they wouldn't be upset that I was sitting here writing a book and they're at home coaching a client or they're at home processing payments or they're at home doing marketing campaigns. They love that. Yeah, and we have a very flexible, very free environment here as well within the Game Changers community. So I guess it's a bit different to where we started, Keith, but there's such an importance there of understanding like, like if you can't be and respect that being in others, how do you ever expect that for yourself as well? And, you know, this is why I, I, I talk a lot in this. It's like, it's the steps to build a business that works without you. But more importantly, it's the psychology you have to go through as well. And the yep. two, you, you have to have the two married together. Otherwise, you won't get there. You, you will find that you're constantly on a seesaw where you have all this money and success, but then your relationships go to shit. Or you've got yep. this amazing relationship and your business goes to shit. And you'll find that you're constantly on this seesaw trying to ride, ride your way through life, never finding, I guess, balance in all aspects of life because the balance is not within you first. Yeah, absolutely. You'll work on yourself more than your business. Yeah. And that's where people fall down. And I don't know why, but they say, oh, I don't like reading. I never liked to read at school and all that. And I, hey, listen, this is not enjoyment. This is this is knowledge you need to actually grow your business. So and, you get over it, suck it up. And, and look, no disrespect to anyone watching this. Like I, I, I acknowledge you for wherever you're at in your journey in business and life. And, and that's okay. I guess what I would like to do is in, in, invite you into a thought that whatever you're experiencing in life right now, whatever you're perceiving outside of you is a reflection of something inside of you. And so therefore, if you're not liking what's showing up for you outside in your financial world, in your relationship world, in your, your, your mental stability world, like in your relationship, like whatever it is, like maybe look with inside of you. And if you're okay with that, great. If you're not, great. But it starts in here first before blaming your partners or your employees or your, your, your shitty clients or anything else outside of it. It starts with you first. Uh, Dave from Perth here said, uh, he's cool. Keith, you're cool. Uh, he's ahead in coaching, but he doesn't seem to care much about online reputation scores and all that. It's a compliment. Um, someone asked a similar question the other day, and it's kind of like, like if, if, if I'm rocking out and I'm, I'm doing my thing and I'm serving clients and I'm super happy, I don't need to grow an online status. Like I've got several mentors and coaches that don't even have a Facebook account and they've got thousands, if not hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of clients and buyers. And they're not even online. Like there are so many people out there like that, but you don't know about it because they're not out there like that. They're not on Facebook. They're not on Instagram. They're just doing their thing and they're creating a huge ripple in the world. Well, it's, you know, we live in a world of distraction and we know we get caught up in social media and, and, and I'm the worst one carrying my, my phone around. But the fact is, and this is an Australian professor in a university in America, on average, each of us spend five hours on a phone every day. Now, you've got to say, what are we doing? And yeah, sure, there are things there that we've got to do on an iPhone. But five hours a day and you say, why aren't we being successful? Well, might have something to do with that. You know, yeah. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you look. You don't need social media to grow a business. I, I might cop some wrath from that, but I'm telling you, I've got several mentors that have got massive businesses, and they are not on social media. Social media makes it easier and potentially faster, uh, but it can be a distraction too if it's not used the right way. And so, I guess you know, similar to a comment I made on yesterday's show, uh, know where you're at in your business journey, and know what you need to be working on right now to move forwards. And if you're unclear of that, like please reach out to us or reach out to someone else who you think might be able to help you to get uh, on the fast track to achieving what is you'd like to achieve through your business and through your life. Uh, Keith, last question. Uh, if you were to give the 10-year-old version of yourself 
some advice knowing all that you know now and being through all that you've been through. What advice would you give him? Clearly, take more risks. Oh, take more risks. Definitely. Love that. All right, take more risks. Great. Uh, if you've joined us today live on any of the platforms, uh, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you've got a huge amount of value out of it. Uh, please hit the like button, show some support. And uh, I'd love if you could tag or share it with someone who you think might need to, to, to watch it, someone in business. You just never know what the smallest little uh, bit of advice or tidbit could do for somebody on their business journey as well. And equally too, uh, if you would like some help to grow and scale your business, please feel free to reach out to, to Keith or myself, uh, thegamechangers.com.au and be more than happy to have a chat and see if we're a good fit. And if we could help you to, to scale and grow your company as well. Keith, so grateful for all the amazing work you do uh, for me and for our team, for our clients as well. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. Barry, uh, thank you. Uh, you've played a very major part in my life and I love you uh, and many people do. What you do is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I don't think people can be successful these days by themselves. They need, they need people, they need expertise and you don't have to invent the wheel. Take the shortcuts yeah. Um, and the game change is a very good example of that or someone like that who can show you the way because it takes too long to find out and you might get um, you, you, you never know uh, what you're going to find along, on the, along the way and it's not so much about what you know now but it's who you know Barry love you thank you very much for inviting me thank you me Keith on. feel the same appreciate you take care everyone thanks very much